on Monday, I hosted a roundtable uh, discussion at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore to review with experts from my community the strategy that we need to employ in regards to the Zika virus. I pointed out at the beginning of that uh, roundtable discussion that the World Health Organization has labeled the Zika virus as a public health emergency of international concern. The World Health Organization has estimated that as many as 4 million will be infected in the Americas. Uh, we know the current numbers of um, reported cases in the United States. Uh, as of last week, we had over 1,300 cases in the United States. Almost all of those, the United States are our territories, almost all of those um, that we have in the United States, in the continental United States, are travel related. Uh, we have 17 report, uh, confirmed cases in Maryland. Uh, those cases uh, are going to go up dramatically. We know that as the summer months uh, 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 and the warm weather occurs, the wet weather occurs, with the mosquito population increasing, we know that the number of people affected by the Zika virus is going to go up dramatically. And here's the challenge. We know that it's transmitted primarily through mosquito bites through mosquitoes. Uh, and we know that in Puerto Rico, for example, that uh, it, it's, it's going to be very active. But we also know in the United States, the mosquito population could very well act as a major transmitter of the Zika virus. But the Zika virus is also uh, transmitted through sexual intercourse. And therefore, uh, people who have the Zika virus, who may not know they have the Zika virus, because many individuals who are affected infected, don't know they have the virus, uh, that this could become a major problem here in the United States. Now, what's at stake here? Well, we do know that the Zika virus is directly uh, linked to birth defect, microcephaly. Uh, that is a tr tragic circumstance affecting uh, fetuses uh, that could uh, present a lifetime challenge for the child that's born with microcephaly. It's, we know it from the small skull, but what I learned at this roundtable discussion is that the complications from microcephaly include lifetime disabilities. Uh, the brain is much smaller, it's not capable, uh, it leads in many cases to blindness or death, and that it's not unusual not only to have the human cost involved in, uh, in this uh, birth defect, but the actual lifetime cost is estimated as high as $10 million for each child that is born with microcephaly. So this is a huge uh, challenge uh, to our country uh, with the spread of the Zika virus. But there's also other conditions that have been uh, associated with the Zika virus, including Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, that is a nervous condition, a nerve, uh, a nerve damage condition that can lead to death. So what is the answer here? And uh, as I was, uh, I had a, in this roundtable uh, discussion, we had the public health officers from Baltimore City, from Anne Arundel County, from Howard County, from Frederick County. We had experts in uh, dealing with um, mosquito control. We had experts who were dealing uh, with the development of vaccines and treatments. Uh, and we, we had a, a robust discussion as to what can be done. First and foremost, Madam President, there was strong understanding that public awareness is going to be critically important to dealing with the Zika virus. The public needs to know. If you are pregnant or intend to start a family, you need to know the risk factors. Now, it would be nice if you could have a test done to know whether you have the Zika virus or not. But here's the problem. The current state of development for the tests uh, have produced two tests that the FDA has made available on an emergency basis. One looks at the person's immune system that shows certain signs that that person has the Zika virus. As I said before, it's not clear whether you'll have any symptoms even though you may have the virus. So this one test uh, looks at your immune system and is not 100% reliable by any stretch of the imagination, 
but it at least gives some indication. In many cases, you have to take the test more than once. There's another test that can be given that if you actually have the virus in your system, it will show that. But here's the problem. The virus does not stay long in your system, but you still have the impact of the virus. So that could come back negative, but you still have the uh, effects of the Zika virus. Also, we're not ex sure as to how long the Zika virus can be transmitted through sexual contact. Uh, that issue is still being studied. So it's very possible that a person may have been affected by the Zika virus, did not realize that the person was affected, and several months later, through sexual intercourse, has transmitted the Zika virus to, to his partner. So these are all areas that we want the public to know more about, and we are developing more and more scientific information on tests that can help us identify those who have the Zika virus and hopefully develop some way of dealing uh, with uh, those who are uh, infected. Obviously, we want people who uh, want to start a family to recognize that they should try to avoid areas where there's large uh, vulnerability for the Zika virus. Uh, that's going to be particularly important uh, this summer. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we are want to develop a vaccine. Uh, Mr. Mr. President, I must tell you, I was very encouraged with the uh, individuals who were involved actually in vaccine development who were at the uh, roundtable discussion that I had about the fact that later this summer, they will start clinical trials on vaccines that can, they hope, produce a way that they can immunize a population from being uh, subject to the, the, the Zika virus. That's very exciting. But before we get too excited, uh, I was sobered by the discussion that tells me that the first round of these vaccines are going to be rather difficult and may take several times you have to take it. It may be for a very short duration and that it will take more time before we can develop the type of vaccines that are efficient, that perhaps are once, once in a lifetime you need to take them, that will protect you from the Zika virus indefinitely. And, and here's also the challenge. Um, the people around, uh, these experts that were there on Monday said this is not just a one-time only situation. We can expect that the Zika virus will be with us uh, in the future. So l let me just give you some of the takeaways from, from, from this discussion uh, that, that took place at Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital. One, uh, and, I, and uh, Dr. Wynn, who is the health commissioner for Baltimore City, made this point when we were talking about the money. I went through the $1.9 billion that the administration has requested. I went through the different uh, uh, agencies, both uh, domestic and international, that would benefit from that $1.9 billion. I then compared it to the $1.1 billion, which has been acted on by the Senate, and showed the differences. Uh, for example, if my math is correct, the NIH would receive $77 million less under the $1.1 billion than the $1.9 billion. We had people from NIH that were at the round table talking about the research that's being done right now to develop medicines and treatments that we hope can minimize the risk of a birth defect from those who have been infected. No, we don't know how to cure it. We don't have a treatment that can cure the Zika virus, but we're hopeful that we'll be able to develop the medical protocols to minimize the risk factors for those who are infected from, birth, from having a child with a birth defect or, or developing the neurological damage. We certainly don't want to slow that down. So I just, what I take away from that discussion, we want to make sure that they have all the tools they need in order to deal with this crisis. Dr. Wen pointed out that if you take a look at some of the action in the House of Representatives where they're taking additional monies away from uh, the, uh, the funds that go to our local health departments, that's counterproductive. Doc, Dr. Wen pointed out that the money that she receives from the public health emergency preparedness funding has been cut, cut, in order to pay for the Zika funds. Well, it's these emergency preparedness funds that are used by our local health departments to reach out and deal with the vulnerable populations to make sure that they understand the risk factors and do what they can to prevent the risk factors. I must tell you, I also was talking to our representative from Maryland, from the Department of Agriculture, which does mosquito controls. Several people talked to me about mosquito controls. One of the things you want to do 
is have a comprehensive plan to eradicate mosquitoes during the season. And it, it's very effective. The problem is that these budgets are capped. They don't have the resources to do what they need to do. They were telling me that we were better prepared a couple years ago than we are today in dealing with mosquito control. So we, we need to coordinate that effort, do a better job on mosquito controls. We can't take money away from these programs. And Mr. Mr. President, they made this point very clearly. The crisis is now. It's here. It's here in America today. And it's going to get worse every month. We know that. And we need to act now on the funding in an emergency supplemental appropriation bill that can get to the president's desk today, not in an appropriation bill that has to go through the process that usually takes until the fall before we can make those funds available. I, I want to just go over a point that was made to me by one of the individuals who was at this round table who is, is an expert on, on cost issues. Um, he, he was explaining to the, me the mathematics here. It's Dr. Bruce Lee. Uh, he's a Johns Hopkins University Associate Professor of International Health who modeled the cost issues here. And he came up and he uses the most conservative estimates that our delay in dealing with the Zika virus will add an additional $2 billion in costs. As, as I said, every child that's born with the birth defect, we estimate the cost to be about $10 million. If we can avoid 100 of these birth defect children, that's a billion dollars. So the first issue, of course, is the human cost of the Zika virus and the impact it has on families and on, on those who are directly affected. But this is, as Dr. Lee said, this is an investment. The money that we're making available is an investment. And what do we need to do? We need to make sure money is available for mosquito control. That's one way we can stop the spread of the Zika virus. We've got to make sure that money is available for our local health departments because they're reaching out to, to uh, pregnant women and and Dr. Wen made a very important point to me that in many cases, you're dealing with low-income families. Uh, they don't have air conditioners. Some cases, they only have screens. And they're going to be more susceptible to the Zika virus because of the mosquitoes. Uh, so they have to reach out. The things that the local health departments can do, the Baltimore City Health Department has been a leader on all this, but they need their resources. So we've got to make sure that we fund our local health department. We certainly can't cut the funds that are being made available. And then we're also proud to work on an NIH and the Center for Disease Control. We've got to make sure they have the funds that they need so that they can develop the ways that we can test and make sure that we know who has the Zika virus and hopefully develop protocols to treat people who have the virus and develop a vaccine as quickly as possible that's efficient and can be widely used to prevent the Zika virus uh, moving forward. All that is possible. All that, I mean, I, I left the, this discussion in Baltimore with hope. There's a way of dealing with it. But we have to express the urgency that this crisis demands. And yes, we need to be an international leader. Part of this is U.S. leadership globally. This is not the last crisis we're going to have. Ebola was, we, 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 U.S. leadership helped avoid an international, worse international crisis than we saw. As a result, we've now developed health capacities in many countries around the world to deal with the next pandemic. We know there's going to be another episode in the future. We need to prepare today for this. There's no more fundamental responsibility in the government to keep our people safe. And we have the opportunity to respond in the right way to the Zika virus. But it requires Congress to provide the tools so that the experts in this area can do their work develop the medical protocols to deal with this, get the information out to the public so they can protect themselves the best possible using uh, uh, pesticide, using uh, insect repellents, using common sense, use not traveling to areas that are high risk areas, particularly if you're pregnant or you intend to start a family. They can take the right precautions and that we can develop a, a vaccine that will protect not only the people of this country, but globally from this uh, healthcare crisis. I'm convinced we can get it done 
Let's start today by passing the funding necessary so our agencies can do the work.